Lincoln Center Dialogue, The Challenges of Leadership. Without trust, a government, particularly a democratic government, cannot work. Because one reason people don't trust leaders is when they're not willing to step forward when the stakes are down. Unless we repair the foundations of American power, not only are we not going to be able to set an example for the world, we're not going to have the resources we need to lead the world. And if we don't lead the world, the world will be unled. I believe that courage also matters and that courageous leaders who are willing to take risks but not just feel that they have to bull ahead in order to prove that they're strong. That's not courage, that's bravado. It's vision, but vision has to be both broad and narrow simultaneously. And you've got to be prepared to say no or not now. And that's a, a hard thing because all of us who run institutions are under enormous pressure from various constituencies to scratch their itch. This program is made possible by American Express and the Metropolitan Media Fund. From the David Rubenstein Atrium at Lincoln Center in New York City, here's Lincoln Center President Reynold Levy. Welcome to the uh, David Rubenstein Atrium for this third in a series on leadership uh, here at the David Rubenstein Atrium. It's um, really terrific to have uh, two panelists to discuss the challenges of leadership and, and public policy. And Nan Cohen, uh, someone who's devoted a substantial portion of her academic life to thinking about leadership in its many dimensions when she wasn't practicing it, uh, both at uh, Wellesley uh, and at Duke. Um, uh, and in Richard Haas, a combination of a practitioner uh, in foreign policy, serving in a wide number of capacities, uh, teacher, writer, um, and leader uh, in the uh, think tank field. Uh, we want to begin with uh, sort of general observations about leadership in, in light of a certain recent election. Um, and uh, before the election, there was lots of talk about um, uncertainty part of which was political uncertainty. And uh, we heard a great deal about political leaders um, suspending decisions, uh, holding off on actions that they might or might not take pending uh, an American election. Uh, we've now had it. And uh, I just have a, an open-ended question about uh, your thinking in each of your respective fields about the impact of, of the election. So why don't we begin with uh, a small subject, the world at large, uh, and a a ask, ask Richard to comment on uh, how he feels about the impact of the election on international affairs. Presidents or candidates can choose what it is they say, but they can't choose their inbox. And whoever gets, uh, in this case, Barack Obama, now about to uh, be returned to for a second term, he inherits a fairly daunting inbox. Uh, you've got all the traditional, if you will, national security challenges, that, uh, uh, whether it's a rising China and a lot of histories about the friction between rising powers and the incumbent great power of the day. You've got questions about uh, Iran and its nuclear uh, ambitions, you've got the turbulence, the financial turbulence in Europe. So we, we can sketch out what would be the inbox. I actually think the most interesting, though, national security challenge uh, facing this president is none of those things. And what it is is here at home. And it's, it's basically putting this country on a trajectory that is sustainable, whether it's sustainable economically, doing something about a trillion dollar a year uh, fiscal deficit. We've now got a debt that's equal in scale to our GDP. This is simply not uh, sustainable. And you look at the myriad of challenges we face, whether in your area, K through 12 education, or we've just had this terrible storm here, and it's once again highlighted the inadequacy of America's uh, physical infrastructure. And so you, you look at what we traditionally call quote unquote domestic or internal challenges, and it turns out this is the greatest national security challenge facing the United States, because unless we repair the foundations of American power, not only are we not going to be able to set an example for the world, we're not going to have the resources we need to lead the world. And if we don't lead the world, the world will be unled. 
There's no, uh, to use an economic metaphor, there's no invisible hand. This is not Adam Smith's marketplace. Without the United States, the world will move in the direction of increased, to use an inelegant word, messiness. So it's up to the United States. We can't do it alone, but it won't happen without us. But we won't be in a position to do it unless we, again, put our house in order. So I actually think the biggest question facing us after the election, given that at one level nothing changed, a Democrat in the White House, you've got Republicans in charge of the House, Democrats in charge of the Senate. Will the same distribution of political forces, if you will, which was unable or unwilling to deliver results before the election, will they be able and willing to deliver results after this election? And I actually think that's the biggest political, economic, and national security question that hovers above us all. Nan, uh, in, in your book, uh, uh, Thinking About Leadership, um, you, you make a point that uh, leaders require followers. And uh, followers of leaders usually trust them. And we've had this extraordinary gap in trust throughout the U.S., not just trust in political officials, but trust in corporate officials. In fact, I think the only two institutions in American life that have not had declining trust that's pretty precipitous over the last 30 years, according to public opinion polls, are the military, the U.S. military, and the Supreme Court. And even the Supreme Court in recent years has had uh, some decline, but not ne nearly as much as other institutions. So when we think about the challenges to leadership in the current environment, um, how does this trust deficit, uh, so-called, play into it? Well, certainly you're right to ask about trust. And without trust, a government, particularly a democratic government, cannot work. One very important optimistic feature that I would name is the excitement in this democracy about the election, the fact that people turned out, stood in line. I mean, we'd had several years of people saying, our democracy is diminished and deteriorating and people don't care, people don't vote, people are apathetic. We've become a plutocracy, an oligarchy, money buys everything. Well, money clearly mattered in this election, but in the end, the image that we and the world saw was people in every part of this country going out to vote. And in the end, the numbers of the votes were what mattered. So these are the followers. And they were willing to step out and say, we choose the leaders. This is truly a democratic system. And I think having that reaffirmed is an important basis for rebuilding trust, that, it, that people's voices do matter. I think it's, you, you asked earlier about um, uncertainty. I think it's also true that before the election, there had been a, a period in which a lot of us felt that, that we were sort of marking time, that we, people were spending too much time focusing on the next steps and not on what needed to be done right now and who was going to be, who was going to come out a winner in the end. But now that that's been resolved, my hope would be that Obama and his team can show some very significant, bold leadership take some risks, and even though I know the obstacles and I know they haven't gone away and the, the um, complexities of the agencies and the divided con con congressional system are still there. But I, I, have, I have a hunch that Obama will use this opportunity to begin to cut through some of the uncertainty and make some, make some, make some plays. Now, if and when he does that, I think that will go far toward rebuilding trust. Because one reason people don't trust leaders is when they're not willing to step forward when the stakes are down. And my hope, I think the hope that all of us share, whether we voted for him or not, is that he will. So I want to ask you both a question, since you've thought so deeply about leadership. Going to the heart of both of your observations is how and whether leaders learn and how and whether they learn on the job, and what the uh, obstacles are, what are the facilitators, what are the inhibitors to learning. And our, at least our democratic theory suggests that elections matter, and elections teach lessons. Well, so I, 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 I wonder what your own thinking is about um, 
the, the way leader, the forces at work that either help or inhibit leaders from I responding. think leaders certainly do learn, at least good leaders learn, successful leaders learn, and the ones who don't usually don't either last very long or accomplish very much. But I'm not sure how much they learn from elections. I think they learn from experience. Ren, you mentioned before that the most highly respected institution in this country is the military. Well, it's no coincidence that the military is better than any other institution I know at learning lessons. That's a good point. Look how systematic the Army and the military after Vietnam. They went to school. And after Iraq, early on, and then the difference between early years in Iraq and then what General Petraeus did, the Army is systematic about learning lessons, post-mortems, after action reports, and it's accountable. The other thing the Army has is accountability. What well, the military more broadly has is accountability. So you look at what happened, you draw lessons, you hold individuals responsible, accountable, careers change as a result. How many other parts of American society can we say that at? One other place where I actually see a lot of learning and a lot of excellence, even though it's not wildly popular, is the corporate world. Again, though, because you're accountable. I mean, take someone like Jamie Dimon. Here he is, he runs, you know, I think, you know, one of the most successful financial institutions in, in the country, but they made a big mistake, even though they still, as he points out, made $5 billion that quarter, but they made a, a big mistake. Their oversight wasn't nearly good enough in some of the, what was going on in their London office with derivatives investments. He fessed up about it said we screwed up, we made a mistake, we've, we've, people are held accountable, we've put into place new rules and oversight mechanisms so this doesn't happen again. That's exactly what you want to do. You know, the, 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 the sign of excellence is not that you never make mistakes. Of course you're going to make mistakes if you're out there doing things, trying to be creative, taking risks. You want to, though, make, learn from them. And again, I think the two institutions, which I believe are most successful in this country, are the private sector and the military. And I think we have a lot to learn from them. So I'd like to switch now from your own uh, comments about others to asking you each to uh, pick up a mirror, because you're both leaders. Um, you've both been leaders of important institutions, both inside I institutions and, and the heads of institutions. So I, I, I'd like you to reflect, each of you, on leadership challenges from a personal perspective. Um, in terms of what are the facilitators and inhibitors uh, to learning on the job and to uh, managing all of the constituencies that are needed uh, to be managed to move an institution forward. Can we start with you now? I think having really good judgment is very important. In my book that you mentioned, Thinking About Leadership, in the chapter on what makes a good leader, I spend most of the time talking about judgment having the kind of combination of intuition, intelligence, and experience that means that faced with a very difficult challenge that you need to deal with relatively quickly, your answer is likely to be a good one. Or you may decide that it's not a timely moment to make a decision, but having good judgment I think is absolutely crucial. And finding ways to test for that when you choose leaders, it's not easy to test for it. But I think it makes a huge difference to leadership. I believe that courage also matters and that courageous leaders who are willing to take risks but not just feel that they have to bull ahead in order to prove that they're strong, that's not courage, that's bravado. I think that's another important gift. And patience. Sometimes you've got to realize you cannot solve big problems all overnight and be willing to let things mulch for a while. And giving other people credit and not taking it all for yourself. Because if you do that, then you've got a much happier team. People are much more willing to step forward and use their gifts for the benefit of the institution. And some of the leaders who have the hardest time are the people who always want it to be anything that's produced have their name on it, which I think is a great mistake. But the last thing I would name, and it goes back to something you said a moment ago, and something that may be more important these days, especially in government, than it, almost anything else, is the capacity to compromise. And compromise is not a behavior in leadership that most people would name first among the virtues. But as we've seen recently, its absence is near fatal for a government institution like ours, where everything is supposed to move together or it doesn't move. I was thinking about Woodrow Wilson, the namesake of my own school at Princeton. 
whose family motto, I'm told, I've never been absolutely sure that this was true, but his Scotch Presbyterian family's motto was, God save us from compromise. And he obviously acted according to that in the United Na I mean, in the League of Nations and several other activities. But he did in his main speech about leadership, which I use in my class on leadership at Princeton, he told a wonderful story about a Mississippi steamboat captain with passengers on the boat who were trying to get to New Orleans. And there was a fog that came rolling over the river. And so he went to the shore and tied fast at a dock because he said it isn't safe to go forward. One of the impatient passengers said, what do you mean it's not safe to go forward? It's perfectly clear overhead. I can see the North Star. And the captain said, yes, but we're not going that way. <laughs> You could answer the, your own question. I mean, you know, you, what you've done here, what you did at the 92nd Street Y, what you did with the IRC. So I, part of me wants simply to defer to you. Uh, since you asked the question, I would say two things. One is uh, priorities. It's not simply what it is you decide to do, just as important as what you decide not to do. Once I asked a friend of mine uh, what kind of a year he had in investments, and he said he had a great year. And I said, really, what, what did you do? He said, oh, no, it's what I didn't do. It was all the bad deals I had the discipline to turn down. So it's, it's, it's vision, but vision has to be both broad and narrow simultaneously. And you've got to be prepared to say no or not now. And that's a, a hard thing, because all of us who run institutions are under enormous pressure from various constituencies to scratch their itch. It might be staff that wants to do something, or boards, or members, or funders, whatever it happens to be. Uh, so you've got to have a, a vision, and you've got to be disciplined enough to stick to it. Thank you. First question. You, I think, are just hitting exactly to where I was going to get, which was going to be public education. And to take it back a little earlier to you know, elementary, middle, and high school. So a lot of what we've been talking about has been education. And one of the points I was going to mention specifically was an increased focus on civics education. So I just wanted to see if you can talk just a little bit and drill down a little bit further about what we need to do in America you know, to educate our population and to really think hard long term to, to build a new crop of civically minded leaders across the country. I think it's essential. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor deserves tremendous credit for her, her effort to teach civics. It first struck me, actually, going back to public policy schools when I taught at the Kennedy School. I'm and a Kennedy was grad over as well, so. <laughs> a long time ago. And one day I realized something. The non-American students knew more about American political history and civics than the American students. More of them had read The Federalists, more of them had read Bryce, more of them had read De Tocqueville than the American students. And that was not a happy day for me. And these were, this, these were elite students. This is, the, this is Harvard. This is, the, uh, this is the Kennedy School. And I think the situation's gotten, gotten worse since then. And for, again, for many schools, this has been cut back. This is lectures. A second anecdote is I was fishing a couple of uh, summers ago, and there was a young man who went to Stanford. And he was a computer sciences major, extraordinarily bright and talented. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Tell me about what you're studying and all that. And I said, I'm just curious. Do you, uh, if you have a computer sciences major, how many economics courses have, do you have to take to graduate? And he said, none. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Well, then how many history courses do you have to take to graduate? And the answer was none. And what you had was uh, the most that was required was a, a, he had to take a couple of courses out of literally like 100 offerings. So you could graduate Stanford. And I don't mean to pick on Stanford. It's one of the great universities in the world. But I worry about the lack of anything approximating a core. I think it's bad for the community's cohesion on the campus, and this is something Nan knows a lot more about than I do. But I think it's also bad. I think every American graduate ought to have under his or her belt certain basic familiarities and understandings with certain classics, but also some of the basics of what makes this country tick, about our political history, about our political nature, about our, the, the basics of, of how economies uh, work, maybe something about the role of religion in the country or the world. Because uh, again, we're entering a global world that's going to affect us, and I don't feel, I don't feel we're doing it. And so either we've got to get it in our schools, or we've got to find some other, maybe online, which I think is you know, a real explosion of information. But one way or another, we have got to fill this gap in, uh, in, a, in American education, or we individually and collectively, I believe, will we'll, we'll pay a price. 
please. Hi, I'm, I'm Georgia Levinson Cohan, and I, my question is really returning to the issue of inequality um, that was raised before, and, and perhaps the distinction or false distinction, excuse me, between inequality um, and economic growth. And I guess my question is, if we if we don't want to discuss inequality necessarily in, in moral or normative terms, um, can we at least address, I guess, one sort of the politics of it, um, and to the extent that the the Gini coefficient or levels of inequality we have here put us in reasonably good company with a number of other sort of unstable unsavory political regimes, one, and two, how, if we're going to achieve the kind of growth, you know, get back to 3%, even to 2%, um, you know, and children under six in this country, one in four, now living in poverty, how do we get to those, back to the economic competitiveness and, and rates of growth uh, with those levels of inequality? Uh, I'm, I'm very glad you raised that, because this was one of the clear distinctions between us, growth and inequality, as a major concern. Certainly, I believe growth is very important. I just don't want to cut up the same pie differently. But there's a lot of evidence that in our country, the periods in which we've had the most sustained growth have been periods of less economic inequality than we have today. You think about the period after the Second World War up until 1970. We were growing fast, and we had much less inequality than we do today. Our country felt more knit together. Everybody was benefiting more. You use the image of the rising tide lifting all boats. Well, that's all very well, but as several people have said recently, if some of the boats are yachts and some of them are small sort of motor boats and some of them are flat sort of rafts, then it's okay to be lifted, but the question is what you're living like and where you're going. And I share George's concern for the way in which the inequality in our country is becoming dramatic compared to what we've ever been in the past and puts us in the company of some countries that we would never have expected to be listed with on the Gini coefficient. And since Tocqueville is one of my, sorry, <laughs> Tocqueville is one of my favorite authors, speaking of academic scribblers, and I think he got many things about America right. I think he was overly optimistic about the staying power of equality and would have been very surprised by how disparate lifestyles, access to resources, and power in our country has become. And frankly, I don't think it's sustainable. I don't think there are many countries in history that have had this level of inequality for a long period of time and not have more social unrest and despair and fragmentation than we want to face. And before, before you comment on it, Richard, this appears also to be uh, happening in other countries as well, this gap that Nan refers to that's become pronounced. Yeah, it is in many cases, again, though, what worries me more than inequality is the fact, for example, that middle class incomes have stagnated for you know, the last decade. So my feeling is rather than focusing on narrowing inequality, my question is how does one bring about an increase in middle class income and improving living standards for them? And it's a diff it leads to a different set of public policies. So it, it's less per se how to narrow inequality which I think, by the way, would happen if you improve uh, lots of things at the, at the bottom and the middle. And then instead, the real question is, how do we rise up large, raise up larger numbers uh, of Americans? What sort of opportunity do, do we give them? Where do, where, does, where do we intervene, if you will, into the market to, to help them? How do we set up a context in which they will, they will do better? I would keep the focus there. I think inequality focuses get you much more into redistribution, certain types of taxation conversations, which I don't think are terribly helpful for, for most of the country. It's been striking in the election how much the middle class was the focus. Both Romney and Obama over and over again talked about the middle class. There were some allusions to the rich, either supportive or critical. Almost nobody talked about the poor. But as we think about the people who are suffering most from Sandy, and I was just in New Orleans and Katrina was on everyone's minds as a comparison, the people who suffered most there, they tended to be the poor people who were most vulnerable. And so talking about the middle class, I agree, is a very important goal. But we should not forget people who are really poor in our country. They're not ever going to be middle class. And they need our support as well. They are our fellow citizens. So I, I think one of the, uh, the bridge that between you may be a redistributionist talk or talk about bridging that inequality is not conducive to the kind of compromise that we discussed at the, at the beginning, or arguably is not. Um, uh, we have a president who's taken some 40 million people and gotten them health insurance. Uh, that's a huge, huge, I mean, not since 
uh, uh, President Clinton's uh, earned income tax credit have we addressed the poor. And one of the reasons that the Democrats didn't tout uh, the health insurance program so much is because it was directed to the poor. Uh, it was designed largely, it had some impact on middle class families to be sure, but it was designed largely to provide insurance for poor people. Um, so uh, I think there's some room, I think you can have an impact um, uh, 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 on poor people. I think you can leaven that inequality without necessarily highlighting it uh, uh, politically. Um, I think this has been uh, an extraordinary rich uh, 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 conversation. You're both uh, very much welcome here at Lincoln Center. I, I thank you for a very rich conversation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, man. This program is made possible by American Express and the Metropolitan Media Fund. <laughs>